was golf. <laughs> I thought I was going to talk about football, but wow. <laughs> I figured I had to tie it in somehow, so they had as many ups and downs yesterday as the Israelites did. So there you go, there's our tie-in. <laughs> About as many miracles. Alright, so we're continuing uh, looking in numbers this week. Last week's lesson, we looked at the spies that got sent out uh, into the promised land to look and see. Um, what, what was there, look at the people, they had very specific instructions on what they were going to look for, they had specific instructions on what to bring back, so that they knew where they were going once they finally made it to the promised land. So at God's direction, Moses sent out spies, he sent out um, 12 spies, leaders from each of the 12 tribes. He sent them out to the promised land, what happened? Was their mission successful? Did they do what they were sent out to do? Yes, they spent about 40 days, um, went into the promised land, they saw all the different peoples that they would be up against, uh, the cities were fortified, but just as God had promised, the land was flowing with milk and honey, is the word that they used. Um, the soil was rich, there was, uh, it was just a land that you would want to live in. So the end of the chapter, what did they end with at the very end of the chapter? All, it was all good, everything was really good, but what was the negative side, what was the downside? Big people and we're small, so they said, right? We can't do this, we can't overtake these men, um, it'll never happen, we're never going to make it. So that's what we're, we're looking at leading into the lesson today. Um, the passage in the book has us starting, I think, in verse 11 of Numbers 14, but I want to go ahead and start at the beginning of the chapter. So after bad reports, we start off in number 14, <coughs> That night, all of the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we, died, we had died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So does this sound familiar? Is this something we've heard from the Israelites before? Yeah, we just did a lesson a few weeks ago um, on the manna coming from heaven. So they were out in the desert looking for food. God rain, rains down manna from heaven. Miraculous food falls from the sky. And they start complaining about all the food that they had to eat in Egypt, and now all they have is this manna, this bread. Um, so they just say, oh, it would be so much better if we just ran and stayed in Egypt. So they hit a hard time, and they forget about all the hard times that they had back in Egypt. Uh, and they want to go back to that. All they can think about is uh, what they had back there and what they're headed to. They can't look to the future. So reading on to verses 5 through 10. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire assembly, The land we pass through is explored, and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. And then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all the Israelites. So at this point, Moses and Aaron can't believe what they're hearing. The beginning of this part um, says they fall to their face, uh, probably in disbelief and frustration with these people that they've led out of Egypt um, with the help of God, with all the miracles that have happened so far, all the ups and downs like we talked about. Um, Moses and Aaron can't believe what, what's happening. But there are two men that we actually talked about last week as well. Two men stood up and addressed the Israelites, um, reminding them how great the land is that they explore, reminding them of all the good things that are to come. 
reminding them of the powerful God that led them out of Egypt, that is the same powerful God that can lead them into this promised land and defeat uh, any of the armies that they will come up against. But what is the response from the people? What are they going to do? They want to stone them. Why do they want to stone them? Don't like the message, so kill the messenger, right? Um, so this kind of sounds a little silly to us, or at least it does to me on the surface. You know, these men stand up and remind them of you know, what's happened in the past, what's to come, and all they want to do is stone them. They don't want to let them be leaders. Um, so I think it's funny that they said we should choose a leader to go back to Egypt and hear two leaders stand up and say, we are your leaders. Listen, we're going toward the promised land. We're trying to lead you where you're supposed to go. Um, but people don't don't uh, listen. So I think we often have that problem today as Christians. This is kind of my first parallel that I want us to look at um, and take from this story. I think a lot of things, a lot of times we can get caught up in sin. Um, we have our mind made up that we're going to do something, whatever that something is, no matter what. And then if somebody comes along and tries to point out that maybe that's not what's best for us to do as a Christian, um, we immediately throw a label on them or we say negative things about them. Oh, they're just a good two shoes. Um, you know, they think they're holier than now, all, all kinds of things that we say when we're just determined to be in sin. We're determined to do something that we know we shouldn't do. So I think you know, a lot of times we look at these stories in the Old Testament um, and we just think how crazy must these people have been. Look at all the miracles that God provided. Um, we see the whole story unfold and we know the endings. Um, we just don't understand why God's people acted the way that they did. But the truth is, these stories are here for our benefit. Um, they're not just stories for us to read and see what happened historically. It's something that we're supposed to learn from. So as Christians, I think we're not all that different from the Israelites. Um, you know, we, don't, we just don't have our stories documented in a book like the Israelites did. If we could document our lives up until now, up until this point in our lives, we'd probably look just as stubborn and just as full as the Israelites did. There are all kinds of things that I know I've done throughout my life um, and rebelled against God or, and not done what I should have done that I would look just as dumb as they are. So if we make the same mistakes, not trusting God, putting other things before God, you know, they built an idol, we don't build idols anymore. There are all kinds of things that we do to put things before God. Um, and then also thinking we know what's best for our lives better than God does. So the lesson we can draw from this part of the passage is uh, to be open to a brother or sister in Christ, correcting them when they're when you see that they're caught in sin. And on the flip side, um, we need to be open to somebody correcting us, I'm sorry. And on the flip side, we need to be that person also to correct our brother and sister uh, if they're caught in sin. So I want to flip over real quick to the New Testament, look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And then flip back over to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. So both, both of these verses are talking about correcting your brother or sister in Christ. Um, I think this is often one of those subjects to where we kind of, there's a thin line to be crossed between um, pointing out fault to your brother or sister in Christ and judging your brother or sister in Christ. Um, there's also a fine line there between brothers and sisters in Christ, and people who are not Christian uh, that we have to be careful on. But as we saw here with Caleb and with Joshua, don't be afraid to point out sin um, to those that are closest around you. Don't be afraid just because they're close that they're going to get mad at you. Um, that's what they did here with Caleb and Joshua. But we know that it ended up being good for Caleb and Joshua. We see how that turned out for them. Um, so as we see in Galatians and Matthew, be gentle about it, be cautious, but don't be afraid to point out sin to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Any thoughts on that before we move on? Uh, 
I was going to say the big takeaway I get from that is the fact about the leadership and where they were supposed to be going. It was supposed to be dependent upon faith in God. The leaders were supposed to be taken there. They had the opportunity to follow. And a lot of times, and I know in my life, I've seen that happen time and time again in churches and stuff where fear has held people, the church back in places because they're afraid to, to put that faith and trust out there. When I was a kid, one of the churches we attended was packed with scenes and growing, but it stopped because they needed, and they needed to move to build a building. Had some that first of all didn't want to leave where you always they've always been. And then we had didn't want to go forward. And then we had there were some that were afraid of the cost. And it was like 40 years before they finally did do that. And today that congregation is growing and going like crazy. But it took them 40 years before they were willing to take that step. Just like the situation here. Even though God was there, they're doing what God wanted them to do. Right? Just needed to move forward in faith and follow their leaders, but they refused and changed leadership and went nowhere. And that's kind of the same thing that happened there. And I've seen that many places in other fashion, other ways, where failures to keep moving because of lack of faith. Anybody else have any thoughts before we move on? On this part of the lesson, the section? Okay. We'll go back to Numbers chapter 14 and verses 11 through 30, which is the passage that's in the book. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me, in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them. But I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought up these people from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, O Lord, are with these people, and that you, O Lord, have been, have been seen face to face, and that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by, by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put these people to death all at one time, the nations who have heard about this report, have heard this report about you, will say, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath, so he slaughtered them in the desert. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as you, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sins of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people, just as you have, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of these men who saw my glory in the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times. Not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went into and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route to the sea. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I have heard you say. In this desert, your bodies will fall, every one of you, twenty years old or more, who was counted in the census, and who has grumbled against me. Not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. So the beginning part of this passage, um, God takes it to the point where he's had enough. 
these overly Israelites who refuse to put their trust in him. He's ready to send a plague over them. I think it's interesting there in the last few verses he talks about, he even points out he's only going to um, punish the ones who grumble against him. And then points out Caleb and Joshua are the only two that are going to survive. To me that indicates everybody but Caleb and Joshua, out of all 600,000 million, however many Israelites there were, all of them complained against God at some point throughout this journey. Um, so God's kind of over it. He's ready to send the plague, and he's ready to start over with Moses, um, just as the, the top of the family tree, basically, instead of Abraham. Um, where else do we see something like this in Scripture, where God's just ready to destroy a set of people or a group of people? Uh, two of them come to mind for me. The first one is what? And the first one in the Bible, Genesis 6. Noah, right? So Noah the flood, in Genesis chapter 6. God destroys everything, every man, every animal on earth. Um, but the reasoning behind it tells us why that happened. Every thought of every man was only evil all the time. It's a whole lot different. As evil as we think this world is today, um, there's still a lot of good in this world. And that's a big contrast from what we read in the Bible um, in Genesis chapter 6. Every thought of every man was evil all the time, with the exception of Noah. Noah was the one that God found righteous. The other one that came to mind for me was Jonah. Um, Reese did a lesson on Jonah a few Sunday nights ago, or maybe a couple months ago. So God has mercy on the city of Nineveh after he tells Jonah to go preach to them. Um, this time, they repent. The city repents. Unlike Noah's time, um, these people obviously still had some good left in them. Um, their wickedness had come up before God, but it doesn't say anything about they were only wicked, only evil all the time. Um, that's why God chose to send a messenger. That's why God chose to send a prophet to say, repent, turn back to me. Um, so there's a passage in Jonah that parallels very well with today's text from Numbers 14. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah is talking to God and he says, I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. I want to reread Numbers 14, 17 through 18 now that I've read that. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as, you, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin and, re and rebellion. To me, these are two very important passages in the Old Testament. Um, I think one of the biggest misunderstandings that people often have about the Bible that, that don't study the Bible and don't understand the Bible very, very well, is thinking that the God of the Old Testament is not the same God we see in the New Testament. Making a stark contrast between this vindictive, um, mean God in the Old Testament, and now we've just got this all-loving God who just wants you to be happy and everything uh, is okay in the New Testament. Um, so I think the problem when people make statements like that or assumptions like that, both of the assumptions are wrong. Um, if you look at the examples in the Bible, where God brings destruction, he's not destroying groups of righteous people. He's not just randomly going off and killing big groups of righteous people or groups that have 20% righteous people. Um, in Noah's day, as we said, the only man left on earth that was righteous was Noah. There was no hope for anyone else on the earth, basically. So that's where destruction came from there. We see with Sodom and Gomorrah, um, Abraham even tried to plead with God. And what was his plea with God? He started out with how many? God couldn't find how many righteous people in that city? Fifty. And Abraham got worried, got worrying and thinking, well, maybe there's not fifty people that are righteous. So he bargains it. Well, how about forty? How about thirty? He gets all the way down to ten. And so God barters with him all the way down to ten. God says, yes, if you can find ten righteous men in the whole city, I will not just destroy all of them just for those ten righteous. It's all it needs is 10 people that are righteous, but those 10 people can't be found. Those are just two examples. Um, but everywhere we see destruction in the Old Testament, we see it because of evil. We see it because of people not following God, not trusting God. So in Jonah and in our passage today, um, when dealing with a group of people who are stuck in wickedness, stuck in sin, God relents from sending calamity, as we read from both of those verses. He's slow to anger, abounding in love. 
That's one of those verses that you don't see in the Old Testament often enough, so when you come across them, I think it's very important to point them out and to show God is slow to anger, abounding in love. And the flip side of that assumption, what we hear on TV a lot today, what we hear a lot of uh, churches teaching and preachers preaching, um, it's the God of the New Testament. They're preaching the New Testament, preaching the good news, but instead of really preaching the gospel, they're preaching happiness. They're preaching be good, be happy. Um, God is love. Um, and since God is love, all he wants you to do is be happy. Um, there's nowhere in the Bible that I've seen. I don't have a verse in the Bible that I've ever read that said God wants you to be happy. I, don't, I think that he does, but that's not his number one priority for our lives. Um, we're here to serve God. One of my favorite verses uh, is in Matthew chapter 18 as well. Um, when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? First is love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second one is to love others. Um, nowhere in that does it talk about being happy because you're not always happy when you're not putting yourself first. But what we do see in the New Testament, um, other than um, the gospel, we see God still treats us as children. We see God disciplines us when we need it, just as he did with the Israelites um, going through the wilderness. In the New Testament, we see God disciplines us as children. So I want to flip over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that the word, the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, then everyone undergoes discipline. Then you are illegitimate children, and not true sons. Moreover, we all have had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected him for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirit and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplined us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. This quarter, we're talking about the Israelites, who were called out and God's chosen people. They were his children. Uh, as he led them out of slavery in Egypt, they continued to turn away and blatantly disobey God. They continued to completely do the opposite of what God said. Um, well, one of the things we well, one of the things we read today, in verse twenty-two, up until where we're at today in Numbers, they've done that ten times. It said that they have gone against God, they have tempted God, tested God ten times. Um, so this reminded me of at home with little ones. Um, Emma often tells me that I'm mean to her, and it's usually after I told her to do something about ten times. And so my response usually is. And Emma, I wasn't mean to you the first time I said it, was I? I wasn't mean the second time. I wasn't mean the third time. But after that, I started to get a little more mean with you, right? Of course, she doesn't like that. Um, but it's the same way with God. If you're going to rebel against God multiple times, he's going to be nice the first time. He's going to be forgiving the first time and more loving. But the more you continue to do the exact same thing over and over, um, as we saw with the Israelites, He's going to get fed up, as we would as parents, parents as well, just as we see in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, Hebrews gives us a quote from Proverbs. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. I think that's something that's dis uh, difficult for us as Christians in the society that we're in today. Our culture is all about me. Freedom that we talked about a couple hundred years ago 
that our forefathers fought for. Freedom has been warped into something uh, that is way more than what they fought for back then. And if you don't like what, if I don't like what you're doing, I'm just going to go be a lawyer and I'm going to sue you and I'm going to be happy no matter what you are. It's kind of what we think of as freedom today. So America, as Americans, we've become stubborn. Um, we don't really like anybody telling us what to do. And so this is a thing that I think is hard for us as Christians. The way that our culture is, the way everybody else around us lives, is I don't want to be told what to do. You don't tell me what to do, and I won't tell you what to do. Now, this is something that I see at work all the time. Uh, most of our problems in the workplace are centered around people just not want to follow the rules or not do what they're told. As Christians, though, we're called to be set apart from the world. We're called to be different. Um, God gives us this Bible for a reason. He expects us to obey His Word. Uh, he expects us to do what He's told us for our own good, not just because He wants to. Just as we said before, we can look back and see the entire story of the Israelites, how it unfolded, and look back and say, wow, they were so stupid. But if we had that same picture of our lives, you know, God probably sees us the same way. Why are you making these mistakes? Why are you doing the things you're doing? I've tried time and time again. I gave you second chances more than, more than enough times. So, with that, we're human. We don't always do what we're supposed to. Um, and sometimes we get disciplined by God. That's what this passage is talking about. We go through hardship. And this passage in Hebrews is telling us how we handle that hardship. We're supposed to endure it just like our fathers would discipline us as kids. Um, so don't be the kid that gets pulled from the playground, kicking and screaming, um, still rebelling as you're being punished, right? Um, live and learn. That's the point of this passage. Live and learn. God disciplines us as children so that in the end, um, verse 11 there, no discipline seems, ple seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. At work, I've been in and around project management for several years. One of the best tools that you can use in project management that's probably one of the least tools used is called Lessons Learned. I don't know if you've heard of Lessons Learned as a project management tool. But basically what it is is after a project is over or after a section of a project, you get the whole team together, you talk about what went well in the project, what went wrong. So the next time you have a project like this, you can open up your Lessons Learned from the previous project. You can make sure that you approach things differently. You don't make the same mistakes that you made the last time. I think that's what we've got to do as Christians. That's what this passage is telling us to do. Um, if we don't stop and take time to think about our mistakes, um, if we don't think about what's led up to our mistakes, what we could have done to prevent them, if we don't do those things, then we're setting ourselves up to fail over and over again, just like the Israelites did uh, after they were delivered from Egypt. That's what I've got for the lesson today. Does anybody have any more thoughts on Numbers chapter 14? Anything you want to add? Mark, you care to close some work? Dear Lord, we want to thank you for blessing us with another opportunity to come to study your word. Lord, we pray that you... Uh, that you help us to, to always have the desire and the drive to, to not just hear about you and about your word to this morning, but throughout the week as well. Lord, we pray that you give us the opportunity to share the gospel with others and, and the ability and the discipline to do so. We ask that you keep us strong, keep us faithful. As you send, we pray.